and welcome to our Waymaking special event. I want to thank everyone for joining us during this important conversation about the impact of vaping with our students. My name is Dr. Christina Connolly, and I am the Director of Psychological Services for the Montgomery County Public Schools. This topic is near to my heart from growing up and listening to stories from my mother who started her career as a drug treatment therapist in Baltimore City. As a school psychologist, I have seen firsthand how addiction impacts our students and their ability to engage in school and with family and friends. Talking about behavioral health as a community is very important. We need to normalize this conversation in our community. Due to stigma, too many individuals do not seek behavioral and mental health support. Too many adolescents use substances as a maladaptive way of coping with stress, mental illness, and or the stressors in their family and school. The cycle must end. We know that people may have additional questions about mental health topics. Please go to our Waymaking special website for the link to the Waymaking videos that cover a variety of mental health topics, including stress and anxiety, suicide prevention, sleep management, and more. However, this conversation is not just about mental health. Our conversation is focused on behavioral and mental health. Today, we will start off with a conversation on what is vaping and its impact on schools. Then we will end with a conversation with our student panel discussion on vaping. This event is a district-wide SSL opportunity. If you are interested in earning SS hours for this event, please stay until the end of this special when we will provide a link to the SSL Advocacy Google Form. Now, we are excited to have our Associate Superintendent, Ms. Rochelle Rubin, set the context for this conversation. and welcome to the Montgomery County Public Schools Anti-Vaping Symposium. I would like to take the time to thank everyone for joining us during this important time. I'm sure you are busy and have lots of other things that you could do, but our, this conversation today with our students about the impact of vaping is a very important one. I am Rochelle Rubin, the Associate Superintendent in Student and Family Support and Engagement in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. This symposium is intended for our students, our parents and our caregivers, our school-based staff, including our administrators. And it's all about learning about the health risks of vaping and the preventative measures, as well as community resources that are available to our schools, communities, and family to access. This event also furthers our Be Well 365 initiative, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. It supports our students' physical, social, and psychological well-being. Speaking about Be Well 365, we are also excited to debut our newest support today. That is the Substance Use and Prevention and Resiliency Education Program. It is a screening and psychoeducational tool around substance use, and it's designed to address the mental, emotional, physical, and wellness aspects of our students and their well being. It also has a component of restorative justice as well. SUPRI is designed to help students and caregivers receive information and support in order to ensure and elevate healthy lifestyle choices. So we have a robust program plan for you today. I hope you will take every minute to listen, learn, and grow. And once again, thank you for joining us today. In today's school hallways, a student's mistake can mean suspension or arrest, but it doesn't have to be that way. MCPS is proud to announce the Substance Use Prevention and Resiliency Education Program. SAPRI is designed as an alternative for high school students who have a first-time substance use incident on school property. First, the SAPRI team collaborates with families and school administrators to determine a student's fit for the program. Then the program is held over four two-hour sessions with continuing support after completion. Founded in the Mental and Emotional Health and Restorative Justice Principles of BWELL 365, 
Students are guided to think critically about their decisions with the support of family and school staff. Supri is where next steps exceed missteps. Thank you, Ms. Rubin. We appreciate your charge and support for this work. To get the conversation going that Ms. Rubin described, we have put together an agenda that spans this next hour and a half. This special is split into four parts. The first part is our keynote address. So without further ado, let's listen to our keynote address from Dr. Ruben Baylor, who is the health scientist with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Health. Welcome everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this presentation. My uh, name is Ruben Baller. I'm a health scientist with the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. I was kindly invited to give a talk on the effects of vaping on our students. So the main thing that we need to be uh, aware of and uh, concerned about is the fact that the brain of young people is developing in a very active, intense way, all the way from childhood to young adulthood. This is an actual image, composite image of many, many brains. Uh, it's a cross-section of the population, uh, people from five, uh, age five to 20. And you see here the actual brain maturing, getting more blue, which means lower neuronal density. And the important thing to uh, to draw the lesson uh, to draw from this uh, composite image is that the very last part of the brain to mature are those in the frontal part uh, of the prefrontal cortex, which is where the CEO uh, of the brain resides. And these are the very last parts of the brain uh, to fully develop. Which brings us to the issue of vaping, uh, which is uh, extremely concerning because it's very popular. You've been probably presented with different devices that kids can utilize, electronic devices can utilize to deliver self-administered nicotine at very high concentrations with very high frequency. These uh, vaping devices can have not just drugs like nicotine or marijuana, but uh, liquids with flavors. These vehicles, these chemical vehicles can deliver uh, different uh, flavors that have been uh, particularly popular flavors like uh, tobacco, fruits, menthol, uh, nuts, spices, coffee, different beverages, uh, bubble gum, etc. cetera. Uh, those have been a very powerful, very effective ways of targeting these devices to young populations. And these devices have been extremely profitable for the companies. This is just a graph going only to 2017 that shows the amount of dollars uh, being produced by the e-cigarettes in the Nielsen Track uh, retail channels between 2011 and 2017. So this is a big business, and this is why uh, uh, we are really uh, fighting an uphill battle here. These are extremely profitable devices, particularly in a world where the uh, smoking of traditional cigarettes has been going down significantly. And this popularity of the devices and their profitability is reflected in this dramatic increase uh, in the amount of e-cigarettes, according to the Nas National Youth Tobacco Survey, uh, among high school students uh, between 2011 and 2019, at a time that traditional cigarettes have been going steadily down. So unfortunately, this new phenomenon, relatively new phenomenon, is uh, undoing a lot of progress that we have been seeing uh, with the historic trends of uh, traditional cigarettes smoking. So why vaping is a bad idea and you should tell your kids uh, this fact uh, often. Vaping is a bad idea because nicotine is addictive. Uh, it can slow brain development. It can affect or impair memory, concentration, learning and self-control, attention and mood. And animal experiments and also epidemiological experiments show that uh, there are changes in the brain that is exposed to nicotine, particularly during developmental years, particularly during adolescence, that make that brain more likely or will increase the chances of using other drugs, will make that uh, brain more likely to engage in other uh, drug use. So there are many reasons for not vaping and for quitting if you already are vaping. And here is a list uh, that you can find at uh, kidshealth.org uh, that you may want to talk to your kids about. Uh, 
first of all is the, the issue of maximizing your potential. Young people should strive to be the best and healthiest version of themselves. There is the issue of addiction. Addiction in, in the growing brain may set up pathways for later addiction to other substances as well. There are the brain risks associated with vaping. Nicotine can disrupt brain development, learning, and mood regulation in low doses. Nicotine can improve concentration, but in high doses, the opposite is true. And in fact, there is this uh, well-known phenomenon, nicotine overdose or NICSIC, which was very rare in the past, uh, which involves vomiting, headaches, dizziness, disorientation, seizures, and even dissociation while vaping, a situation when, when kids can't remember where they are. We have never seen these symptoms in cigarette smokers, but now they are increasingly common in vapors, nicotine vapors. Then there's the use of other tobacco products. Vaping, which was supposed to reduce the risk of traditional cigarette smoking, is likely, in fact, to lead to the use of tobacco in other forms, like, like, like hookahs or cigarettes. Then there is sports. Vaping may lead to lung inflammation, irritation, and directly affect athletic performance. There is the issue of money. Vaping is expensive, and youngsters priced out of their vaping habit may start turning to conventional cigarettes, the very products that e-cigarettes were marketed as an alternative for. And then this may be particularly attractive for young kids to use a prevention message. The idea that you can go against tobacco company advertising. Many e-cigarettes are made by the same companies that produce regular cigarettes. Their marketing targets young people by making fun flavors for e-cigarettes and showing young, healthy people vaping. These are their uh, advertisement uh, strategy. They're trying to make kids and teens of today into their new lifetime customers. There are the known health effects, long-term consequences unknown, but preliminary data suggests problem ahead. There are also the toxins that are parts of the vehicle. Uh, they are actually poison chemicals in these compounds, in these uh, uh, solutions. The inhalation of harm harmful chemicals and very fine particles can indeed damage the lungs. And just to show you one such experiment, this is an animal experiment done with rats uh, that were exposed for four months to uh, e-cigarette uh, uh, vehicles or the vapors, they do not induce lung inflammation. And this is with or without nicotine, clearly seen here. However, when you look at these alveoli, these alveolar macrophages, which are some of the cells that uh, mediate natural immunity in the lungs, you can see the effect of smoke. And here you can see the effect of E6, either uh, vaping, uh, either with or without nicotine. This is not mediated by the nicotine itself, but by the vehicle. This affects these vacuoles or this lacuna, these lakes inside the macrophages are the result of a, a, a exposure to this uh, vehicle alone. And in fact, if you take rats, or mice in this case, and you expose them first to e exposure to this vaping, uh, uh, the vapors of this vehicle, and then you expose them, you challenge them with the, the flu uh, itself, with, an influ uh, with the flu A infection, uh, there is a significantly higher uh, death rate among those that were exposed to uh, the e-cigarettes suggesting that the uh, e-cigarettes exposure alters this immune response and the recovery from influenza A infection. This uh, defect in natural immunity in the lungs could be a real problem now in the middle of a pandemic and could be uh, one of the drivers of the increased death in some of the uh, vapors that we've seen during the pandemic. So. E6 alters the physiology of lung epithelial cells and resident immune cells and promotes poor response to infectious challenge. This is another effect that we should be talking uh, to our young people as well. So what can we do as parents or caregivers? As parents or caregivers, you have an important role in protecting children from e-cigarettes, of course, that's why you're here. You have to talk to your child or teen about why e-cigarettes are harmful for them. It's never too late. You have to set up uh, set a good example by being tobacco free at home as well and learn about the different shapes and types of e-cigarettes and the risks of e-cigarette use for young people. Uh, this is one particular website that has a lot of information, CDC.gov. But there are three resources that I like to point out to you. One is the No Safe Vape that comes out of Dartmouth. Obviously, we have our NIDA Teens website at teens.drugabuse.gov also with a lot of information and there is the website put out by the truthinitiative.org about quitting and different approaches and strategies for quitting. The last website that I resource that I like to point out to you 
is this hot topic. It's not a coincidence. Also from the Truth Initiative, it has a lot of uh, very nice articles, very nice uh, uh, videos, video clips, and uh, documentaries. Uh, um, one, uh, for example, this uh, one that it, this screenshot shows the black neighborhoods uh, have more tobacco ads than other neighborhoods, and it's not a coincidence. It's profiling. They have a very good messaging that I think you were going to find particularly effective. And I like before closing, I like to point out this documentary from this same website in the truth uh, called Black Lives, Black Lungs, that I found particularly impactful, uh, very consequential. And I think I, I suggest, I, I recommend that you watch this with your uh, youngs, youngsters at home. Uh, I, I really think and I hope that it will have a profound impact on their perception of the harm that they can trigger in their uh, in their lives and and, uh, and health uh, with this particularly toxic behavior and i thank you for your attention and here you have my email uh, in case you have questions uh, later on thank you very much and have a great day We want to thank Dr. Ruben Baylor for those inspiring thoughts and action steps. And so next, our event has three additional parts, two different panel discussions, and then a period for questions and answers. The first panel will focus on what is vaping and the impact on schools. The second panel discussion will focus on student voices around vaping in our schools. We will also um, be interspersing um, videos from our student 2002 PSA contest winners. Um, throughout, you can post your questions in the Q&A box. Four of our colleagues colleagues will compile the questions so that the panelists can respond to the questions in the third part of the program. Um, I also want to make sure that our students are aware that any information that goes into the chat, um, that this is an MCPS event and students are still held to the student code of conduct. Um, so next, we are going to talk about what is vaping and its impact on schools. Um, to get us started, I would like to introduce our first set of wonderful panelists. So for our first panelist is Robert Alvarez, who has more than 15 years of experience in substance misuse, prevention, and youth development, and community development nationally and internationally. He is a Fulbright public policy scholar um, from Guatemala in 2016, 2017, and previously served in the Peace Corps in El Salvador. Welcome, Robert. Next, we have Dr. Zukia Chambers, who is a clinical pharmacist and currently holds the rank of Lieutenant Commander in the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. She works as an administrative officer within the immediate office of the Director of Commission Corps Headquarters. Welcome, Zakia. Next, we have Dr. Carr Grant who is the pre-K to 12 health and physical education supervisor in curriculum instruction in the Office of Teaching and Learning in Schools. Welcome, Cara. And lastly, we have Ms. Sarah Rose, L LCPC, um, who is the supervisory therapist of screening and assessment services for children, adolescent, or SASCA, and has been working with youth and adults with addiction and mental health concerns for over a decade. She previously managed substance use and mental health programs in outpatient, intensive outpatient, and residential treatment settings. Welcome, Sarah. So now as all of our panelists turn on their cameras. So first, I would like to start the conversation off with a general question to help our audience understand the topic today. We see the majority of students who are exposed to vaping in middle school. Um, can you describe what vaping is and how are they exposed to vaping? Hi, Dr. Connolly, this is uh, Cara Grant. I'd like to respond to that question. Uh, so vaping is the inhaling of a, a vapor um, through an electronic e-cigarette or other vaping device. Um, usually these are battery powered devices uh, or cartridges. They contain nicotine, flavorings, and chemicals. Um, the vapor is heated uh, in which the person inhales, and that's why it's called vaping. Um, and then that stuff that comes out of her <laughs> after people do that is... Um, the vapors of all those chemicals that are being consumed through those devices. And those are all um, 
pretty much unregulated and have a high impact um, as we saw in the previous resource. Uh, so once again, that's flavors, chemicals, nicotine, which is the addictive substance that makes us so worried about this, um, as well as that there's just really no long-term studies or effects on it, but we do know that there are high short-term effects that impact the body. No, thank you. Does any else from our panel want to share any information? Hi, this is uh, Lieutenant Commander Chambers. Um, not sure what's going on with uh, my camera right now, uh, but just I wanted to touch on uh, the second portion of your question, kind of how students are exposed uh, to vaping. And pretty much it's, it's multiple avenues. Um, just as the previous media stated, one of the biggest influences are people that they know, family, friends, um, even celebrities. So they, a lot of students consider them close to their celebrity, um, people that they admire. And uh, most importantly, social media. Um, E-cigarette companies have spent millions of dollars on advertising on social media platforms, such as you know Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, platforms that they know the youth are on, you know, just to make sure that they try to start using their products. Right, no, and thank you. And and you're right, like there is so much influence um, with, um, for our students, you know, even starting as early as elementary school, although, you know, a significant number of our students are first exposed to vaping in middle school. And then by watching the ads on social media, you know, especially if you're children or on TikTok, YouTube, um, Instagram, so forth, um, as a way of them seeing this as something that's cool, and, you know, and then going into um, our next question. So because we do have students who say, you know, often that they are vaping, you know, the flavor only. They think that they have this advice and it's cool and it smells good because they, you know, I mean, they think about they flavor, you know, vaping devices and, and the liquids um, with flavors like bubble gum, you know, like fruit punch, things that, you know, are things that young folks um, interact with. And so, you know, how can you tell, you know, what kind of e-juice um, is in their vaping device? And then do students always know what they are vaping? Well, as Lieutenant Commander Chambers, again, I'll actually start off and take that question as well. So by looking at the vaping product, there actually is no way to physically tell what the contents of the e-liquid are. So there are companies, as you stated, that market products such as flavor only. However, this is actually very rare. Um, even if you see something that's labeled flavor only, there are added ingredients such as the propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, et cetera, that students are unknowingly also ingesting. Um, overall, the content of chemical, tox chemical uh, toxins that are within a vaping device they're stated to be less than were in cigarettes, so that gets people thinking, well, it can't be that bad. However, these toxins, no matter, sometimes at any amount, can still be harmful. There are even some uh, e-liquids that have contents such as what are the ingredients of antifreeze or formaldehyde or other cancer-causing chemicals. And sometimes there are even like heavy metals such as nickel that, you know, we're not supposed to be ingesting, of course, and, you know, causing scarring and whatnot to the lungs. Thank you. And, um, and this because it's really important for our students to understand that when they're in ingesting these chemicals, that it's just not water vapor. Like I hear that a lot. Well, it's just water vapor. It's just water. It's not going to harm me. And that's absolutely false. And so we really want to make sure that we are answering student questions, you know, because there's a, so much misinformation um, that's out there. I'd also like to add in as well that not only um, you know can can nicotine be in these substances, but there are also varying degrees of nicotine. You know, there are some that have very small amounts, and then others that have a whole lot of nicotine. Um, and so that's one of the concerns. And then there's also um, vapes that have THC, and just by looking at the device, you really can't tell just by looking at it. The other um, recent, because this is more of a recent issue and it's just becoming more and more escalated with use, is that there's um, a study out of Stanford that came out showing the correlation with what we're in right now with COVID 
and how it does make the, the immune system weakened uh, as a result of use. So um, for short-term consequences, this is going to really hit you hard quick. Um, and that's why we really want to prevent anybody, especially our students, from using this. No, thank you so much. And, um, you know, especially as we are in the, the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, when we have seen the stories on the news of um, teenagers who vape, who then end up in the hospital when they catch COVID, um, and because of the impact on the immune system and the impact on the lungs, it literally, like, you know, like clogged up their lungs and laid to a point where they couldn't breathe. Um, and so, you know, all of these impacts, you know, we really want to make sure our students and families are aware um, of the negative impact that vaping has. And so next, you know, I want to get into, so Ms. Rubin described in her welcome an initiative where students can participate in a program to get help for substance use. So can you describe some initiatives where students um, can get help in schools? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, so one of the new curriculums that was recently developed with the MCPS is SUPRI, which is the Substance Use Prevention and Resiliency Education uh, Program. Um, so this program really seeks to build competencies among parents and youth. Uh, so they seek to build mindfulness, uh, refusal, uh, refusal skills, uh, increase self-esteem, uh, build parent-child communication, uh, decision-making skills, as well as increase awareness of the dangers of substance use. So really looking at uh, addressing perception of harm among young people. Now, this program uh, works with the youth and the parents together, as well as uh, in small groups. So it's really a comprehensive approach to really building upon uh, strengths that young people bring together, as well as equip parents and youth with the tools necessary to continue to go through and navigate through, uh, through any issues or challenges they might have uh, pertaining to substance misuse. No, thank you, Robert. I'm so excited that um, you're bringing up SUPRI. Um, just as um, the first true diversion program in MCPS, you know, as a way of students. So and instead of um, receiving a disciplinary consequence, you know, they can go and get help for their substance use. Um, and, and, you know, I'm just really excited to see this initiative um, start um, in our schools. Exactly. And I'd like to add also uh, points of contact are Stephanie Izard, as well as Sean Jelly from the uh, Wellbeing, Achievement and Restorative Justice Unit at um, MCPS. No, thank you. And I know Mr. Kelly is helping us out with the chat today. So we're really excited. Ms. Izzard is, you know, one of our, you know, well-known folks on our Waymaking team um, that supports us and is helping us today as well. She's quite the producer. So um, we thank both of them for all of their, their commitment in helping with this initiative with Supri as well. Um, and so... Um, and on here, so then also I'm curious, so I know we have Dr. Grant, who, who is an expert within our health education initiative. Um, do you have any information to share with our families in terms of um, how this impacts, you know, that as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, and this hits home everywhere, right? Uh, knowing um, and informing uh, students, families, uh, and just even community members is what really holds us accountable. Um, we start the health education curriculum as early as pre-K and we go up through high school. And it's important that students um, have the communication skills that they're confident to say, uh, is, are you supposed to be doing that? Like, is that something you should be doing? Like whether it's vaping or bullying or harassment or or just not lifting each other up because we need to lift each other up virtually in zooms as well as those that live in your home so equipping our young people with uh, good communication skills to, and self-awareness linked to social emotional learning to say hey that's not right you're not supposed to do that that hurts or harms your body um, and being able to identify that that device is not a toy, is not water vapor, you know, that it actually has a drug in it. And then as you get older and older, um, being able to identify those. And it does hit home. And I'll, I'll be a little vulnerable right now and share that, you know, I'm a mom of four boys. And one of my sons came and said, mom, what is this? And took a picture. And my, my oldest son had that in his room. He had a vaping device in his room. Um, and so we had to have that conversation 
um, as a family, we had to call a family meeting and we had to talk through, like, what are you doing? What is that? Do you know what's in that? Do you really know what's in that? You bought that off a line and they just, you know, like, and so it, it, like I said, it really does hit home. And I, I really commended one of the boys for, for finding that device hidden behind the bed against the wall under the mattress, not in plain sight. Right. Um, and elevating that to me as mom and to my husband as dad to say, I don't think my brother should be doing this. Um, and, and he was really worried because he had seen all the popcorn lung and people dying and all of that. And so that's what I mean by community, like lifting each other up, holding each other accountable, calling each other out, um, and really just being aware and helping each other redirect to a healthier way. So thanks for letting me share that. I know it was a lot. <laughs> no, that, thank you so much for sharing your personal story. And I truly think that it can help, you know, families um, who may be going through something similar. So thank you so much for that. And so then I want to get to my last question for our first panel. So let's say if you have a parent who is concerned that their child may be experiencing substance use or other mental health symptoms. So what should our families do when they, if they have that situation? So I'm the supervisor of a program within Health and Human Services in Montgomery County, and it's called SASCA, S-A-S-C-A. -S it stands for Screening and Assessment Services for Children and Adolescents. And we are a free program for anybody who, any youth who lives in Montgomery County, and we have licensed therapists who will provide a free behavioral health assessment and make referrals for treatment or other support services as, ne as needed. Um, so if there are any concerns about mental health or substance use among, you know, teenagers, we are a resource in the, in the county. Thank you. And so, you know, I thank you for sharing the information about SASCA, you know, and I also want to bring up that MCPS also has another program called RAP. Um, and it is a way, another way of students to get um, substance abuse um, support um, while also still engaging in their education. And so, and if families, um, and that's a more intensive um, service than SUPRI. Um, and so, and that is running in partnership with Shepherd Pratt. And so as part of the landing, we do have a way making video video on that as well. So if your families are looking for more information, you can go to the Waymaking site. You can also contact your building administrator um, for additional information about RAP, about SASCA, um, and other um, supports that are maybe available within the county. So, you know, I want to thank you all um, for this conversation. And in a couple of minutes, we will introduce our next set of panelists. Our panel will be back um, for our question and answer period later in this forum. So next we are going to transition. Um, we're going to transition to another question in a minute, but please feel free to submit your questions on YouTube so we can get a sense of what people want to address in the last part of our session. And as you are writing your questions, we are going to take a couple of minutes to share um, videos um, from our PSA winners from last school year. Just sitting in my room with a plate of grilled bacon. Call my man Tim just to see what was shaking. Yo, Spence Vapin is dope and pretty. So come on over and hit it with me. They call it Vapin. What? It's an epidemic. Vapin. What? It's an epidemic. Vapin's not cool. It's pretty silly. And I'm about to tell you why it's not so chilly. Vapin can't affect your learning and even make you feel like your life is turning. It affects memory, attention, and self-control. And sadly, it can even take away your soul. You see, vapin can cause damage to your lungs, especially if you start when you're young. Vapin can lead to other addictions. Trust me, I ain't spitting fictions. You may lose your friends or your social life. And maybe even get left by your wife. Remember, it's not who cool to do. Do, do, do. As you can see, there are many flaws. Vaping can even put your life on a pause. They call it vaping. What? It's an epidemic. Vaping. What?
Is it worth it? E-cigarettes contain toxic chemicals such as nicotine, an addictive stimulant drug that can harm brain development. The chemicals can also harm the lungs, resulting in irritation, inflammation, and even lung cancer, which can lead to death. There are also psychological consequences to vaping, such as mood disorders, depression, anxiety, an alteration in emotions, and addiction. So is it worth it? To quit, text Ditch Jewel to 88709. outbreak of significant lung illness and death. As of November 5th, 2019, there are 2,051 reported cases and 39 deaths due to vaping. Most of these cases, over 80%, but not all, were from users who reported use of THC vaporizer products. Nicotine is the primary agent in both regular cigarettes and e-cigarettes and is highly addictive. It causes you to crave smoke and suffer withdrawal symptoms if you ignore the craving. Nicotine is also a toxic substance. It raises your blood pressure and spikes your adrenaline, which increases your heart rate and the likelihood of having a heart attack. I want to see a bear do ballet. <laughs> Vaping may isolate you from your friends. It can create a divide between people as it takes time away from your social life. To get help, text Ditch Jewel to 887 09 or the Quick Start app. All right, so. Wonderful video. So in our last section, we talked about what vaping is and its impact on schools. So, but I am excited to introduce our next panel of MCPS students. And so first, our first student is Opsi. She is a 10th grade student at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. She has spent the past few months mobilizing fellow youth against flavored tobacco products and advocating for the passage of SB 177 and HB 134 in the Maryland General Assembly. Welcome. Next up, we have Jaslyn, who is a 10th grade student at Albert Einstein High School. She is an advocate for education equality. Welcome. Our next student is Phoebe, who is a senior at Winston Churchill High School. She is deeply passionate about advocating for students who have experienced sexual abuse, assault and harassment at MCPS, and closing the achievement gap. Welcome. And our last panelist is Afia, who is a sophomore at Poolsville High School. She is also a state affairs deputy on the MCR SGA executive board, an intern to board member Lynn Harris, and a national student political advocate. She is known in Montgomery County for her advocacy on racial justice, health care, climate justice, gender inclusivity, and her poetry. So welcome. All right, so now that we have all four of our students. So my first question is, so what are teenagers not aware of when they start to vape? Are there any particular side effects that vape companies tend to obscure from the audience? Uh, I think, first of all, a lot of teenagers don't actually know what's in vaping devices. They don't know the risks. They've just seen this romanticized image of this aesthetic type of like smoking, but it's not cigarettes, so it can't harm you. Um, a lot of students don't know that they could have potential side effects later on in life and short-term side effects. A lot of students when they um, who have vaped when they've catch COVID, they're um, immediately at higher risk. So it's mainly, I mean, Vaping hasn't been a thing for that long, so we really don't know the long-term side effects, which makes it even more scary. No, thank you. And so, yes, no, and I do agree that there are a lot of students who are not aware um, of the um, negative effects um, of vaping on them and their body and their lungs. So, good. So, and, you know, and thank you for sharing that. Um, does anyone else have anything else that they would like to share as well? 
Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Adya Parna. Um, just to add on to what Phoebe said wonderfully, um, I feel like us teenagers, um, when we think of the nicotine devices that we are putting in, a lot of the companies tend to advertise or market this, um, like the, the vaping devices as having no nicotine at all. But in contrary belief, there's actually quite a ton of nicotine. And in fact, there's more nicotine than a pack of cigarettes. And I feel like that aspect is heavily obscured from the teenage community. So when they do start vaping, they don't really realize the very harmful toxins and chemicals we they inject in their bodies. So from that, that's definitely another really big hidden fact that um, I feel like teenagers aren't as aware of. Thank you. So and that kind of goes into my next question. So what are changes that you have seen with people um, that start vaping? I definitely do think that people that start vaping do isolate themselves. And like sometimes as teenagers, you think that like these effects that you hear about are all like exaggerated by adults, but it's actually really true that it becomes kind of like the person and their vape and they just don't think or consider the people around them because of their addiction. No. And, you know, and it's kind of like with the, the last PSA and they had the student who became isolated um, from vaping. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that all students are aware of the impact that substances may have on them and how it um, impacts their behavior in schools, um, even their ability to learn and to, um, you know, attend school, be able to participate, to understand, to concentrate on what's going on. Because um, um, substances definitely have an impact on the brain as um, Dr. Baylor shared in his keynote earlier. And so then my next question is, so we're talking about all this, we're talking about all these negative effects, but you know, but so why um, would each of you, so think about it. So why would you never vape? So, and, but why do you think that others vape? Personally, I would never vape because I'm a student athlete and I know the impacts it can have like long term and how it can make your performance worse. But I think that other people vape either like because they think it's cool and because they want to fit in or because it's like an outlet for them and they just have no other way to kind of put their time um, and just they think that to if they're stressed, it will like relieve them when they don't realize that it becomes an addiction and that they become reliable on that vape. And, and so, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, to add on to that, I would also say that um, the thing about once you start vaping, it's kind of a gateway substance into other substances. I've had many friends who started vaping and then they've moved on to alcohol, to different types of drugs. And that has not only impacted them, but impacted their family as well. And that's part of my reason for not vaping, because I know that it's not going to only, you know, physically, mentally and emotionally hurt me, but it's going to also leave a devastating effect on my loved ones. Having to watch your child break down like that at the hands of big tobacco and not being able to do much because they are so disconnected from you. And at the end of the day, it's really only their perseverance that can really ensure they turn around and come back from their addiction. Right, no, and, and you talk about a concept, we call it gateway drugs. And so those who um, may start by vaping, then all of a sudden think that, okay, well, maybe they become addicted, they or, or become their body because it was called tolerant to the drug and they're looking for something that's stronger. And so then they may go on to look at um, stimulants like cocaine or opioids, like heroin and other types of drugs that are out there um, to start using um, that are have a stronger impact. You know, so um, that's an important piece of information um, for our students and our families to be aware of that, you know, you can start with this and then go into other types of drugs that are even more harmful. Um, even though I'm going to tell you the impact of nicotine, like no one wants to have in like COPD or lung cancer. And so because death by not being able to breathe um, is a horrible experience. And so and I just know of a lot of adults who smoked, you know, Know, and started smoking in high school and then all of a sudden here they are in their 40s 50s and then all of a sudden you know they're 
their death, you know, and they have to leave their families or loved ones um, from starting this at a young age. And so it does have a significant long-term impact. Um, and even as you grow up and let's say you want to go and you get life insurance or health insurance, they're going to charge you an additional fee because you smoke because they understand the impact that um, smoking has on the body and that they're going to charge you more. And so um, it's just important for our um, students to understand this um, at a young age um, so that they can stay away and learn the negative impact that this has on them. All right. And so then and that then kind of also then ties into my next question. So then do you believe that vaping companies target students and especially those in predominantly neighborhoods of people of color? Yeah, I could take this one and I most certainly do. Um, tobacco companies have been using flavors to make their products more appealing to users, um, new users, especially most of whom are kids. And they use like enticing flavors like gummy bear, cotton candy, mango, and more to addict kids. And aside from like what's in these vape devices, you have to think about their like physical composition as well. Um, take for instance, dual products. They have that like slim, sleek, and small exterior that's like easy to quickly slip into your pocket. And that looks like a flash drive because this was Big Tobacco's way of, you know, not only shoving down these toxic chemicals into students' throats, but to also tell students, hey, we can help you lie about this. Like we can help you cover up your vape use as well. And then in terms of communities of color, um, especially students of color, tobacco companies have also had a really long history of going to great lengths to target black and brown communities. And not only have they, I know we previously touched on how they marketed more heavily in black and brown communities, but I would also say there's a huge price difference. Um, if you visit corner stores in communities of color that sell tobacco products, you'll find that those products are at a far lower price than um, product, vape products in predominantly white communities. And so all of this very aggressive targeting of communities of color, especially students of color, um, has caused there to be like a very disproportionate rate of black and brown students who vape compared to white students who vape. And you don't even need to see it in the statistics. Like if you go to our schools as we all have before virtual learning, we've seen the disproportionate rates and it's honestly been heartbreaking. No, and when we think about this in terms of an equity issue, I mean, it's so important, you know, that, and I understand, you know, when it comes to talking around mental and behavioral health, especially in our communities of color, there's such a significant stigma. And, you know, people, you know, really don't want to discuss it. And so, and then that leads to if you need help with this, do they go and seek help? You know, do they go to their school counselors or school psychologists um, and administrators or other staff in the building and ask for help for their children um, who are addicted um, to these substances? And so, we have to work with our families on, in all of our communities in MCPS, but especially, you know, our communities of color, um, especially communities um, that are impoverished, because um, we also know that when it comes to students, let's say, who are white, who are impoverished, they are at high risk of using uh, vaping as well. And so how can we, you know, and my, and my next, my follow up question is, so how can community members um, combat this issue, um, both in their neighborhoods and, you know, some things that you can do throughout the state. Well, in terms of throughout the state, um, as was mentioned earlier, there, there are two bills right now that are in the Maryland General Assembly, and they're so important. Um, House Bill 134 and Senate Bill 177. Um, both of them would end the sale of flavored tobacco products. So that includes um, e-cigarettes, vape products, and that right now is one of the biggest um, methods that everyone, including students, can combat big tobacco and the way they target students. Um, you can, you can, there's like a website and I could try to find a way to drop it in the chat for everyone um, where you can not only send a letter to your senators, but also your House delegates to tell them to pass this bill. And it will also be addressing the fact that um, black and brown students are also targeted the most. Um, and aside from that, like aside from the legislative action you can be taking, I would also say that having Honestly, having these vulnerable conversations with not only your, if you're a parent, having these conversations with your um, child, but also if you're just a student, if you notice that your friend is like starting on this like free fall with tobacco products, especially vape, 
then it's really that time to really sit them down and have that heart to heart, which can be hard. But at the end of the day, if you have those statistics to remind them that this is a fight they will not win, then I think it's definitely going to be something that they're willing to listen to you about. All right. No, thank you. And so then and we talk about, you know, the impact of communities, but I also want to get into, so how has vaping affected teenagers of neurodiversity, you know, more potentially than other students? Um, I can definitely take this question. So um, when we look at the neurodivergent community, there's often a lot of stigma in terms of when we're, when we're thinking about teenagers of the neurodivergent community as well. So there's a lot of stigma and we tend to kind of exclude this community simply because of societal norms and like, you know, they're not acting as like, you know, like the tended normalcy as like we perceive it to be. And when we look at that, when they look at that, when they realize that, oh, I, I can't fit in, I, there's no way for me to fit in, then they take upon these routes of vaping, especially because they see that vaping is something that would make them seem normal, would make them seem like that they're not like any like unique in any way, and they can conceal themselves along with their peers. So when, so definitely when, um, uh, like big tobacco and jewel companies, when they target these students of neurodivergent neurodivergence, um, they tend to make advertising such as like, oh, this will help with your hyperstimulation every single time you have a breakdown in class, every single time you start stimming, every single time you just like, you know, go into this like this um, this hyper sense when your brain just, just just loses like all sort of sense. This will help you calm down. This will help you take that math test in peace. This will help you just do everything completely fine. And that is the most heartbreaking thing I believe every parent of a neurodivergent student can ever hear. The fact that these companies are knowingly targeting these students and making them pit fall into a very vulnerable state, that is definitely a very heartbreaking thing that I think that no family should ever have to go through. And it's, it's especially even worse when the fact that they are just targeting this community simply because of the fact that they do not think the same way that we do. And that's definitely an experience that I, I hope that no family ever goes through. No, thank you for sharing that. You know, and that's definitely an important part for our families and our students to hear, you know, and, you know, trying to make sure because I mean, when you think about the advertisements and how, you know, they use certain words and certain graphics in order to tie into certain groups to make you feel like, you know, this will make you feel like you belong. I mean, just think of just how, what a, a powerful message that can be and what we have to do in order to, you know, help students to understand that this is marketing and that they're doing this as a way in the sense of trying to manipulate you um, into buying their products. So um, thank you for that. You know, it's a very important point to make. And so and that again goes into my next question in terms of, so how it advertisers targeted teenagers to start vaping, you know, and, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, but then also how accessible are, vaping devices to get yeah so um everything that big tobacco does to it in terms of the product placement the design of the product the flavors that is all done very very intentionally because if you look um for you know i'm in 2002 baby for the older members of gen z when vaping started to be you know introduced into our society that was not covered in health classes and obviously MCPS has changed this now, but like when I was in elementary school and middle school, there was very little, if any, mentioning of vaping. All we knew from everything to Cartoon Network ads, to stuff our parents told us, to, you know, health class was that smoking is bad, cigarettes will give you cancer. So we were just like, okay, smoking is bad. So you see that like not a lot of people in my generation tend to smoke and big tobacco figured this out. They were like, oh shoot, like they're not going to buy our product now. But this product is so very addictive. And if we change the way that we market and shape this product, then we can get a whole other generation of kids addicted. And we were supposed to be the generation to end smoking. So originally, vaping devices were marketed as ways for people who are currently smokers to sort of control the amount of nicotine within their system through the use of an e-cigarette to help them like gradually like wean off and quit smoking. But they say that, and then you look at the ads, you look at flavors like birthday cake, cotton candy, fruit punch, all 
kid related flavors you see in their ads they have young people partying the smoke like it looks like cool and like mysterious has a little bit of like a smoke and mirrors effect so everything that like in terms of the design so i mean it looks not that it looks like a flash drive and is a student can just hide it in their sleeve that design very intentional so it's easy for students to hide it and so parents or other community members they might not know what it looks like because it, it easily could look like a flash drive and in terms of accessibility i mean obviously they're very small and even though they might say oh you can't like legally buy it until you are this age or show id I mean, everyone knows an older person. Everyone knows a college student who could buy this for them, an older sibling. So even with the age restrictions on who can buy it, it's really not that hard to get. And especially when younger students want to buy it. And if they don't know somebody, they might buy from somebody at school, but they don't know what's in there. People can lace pods with other dangerous chemicals, which is the really scary part of all of this. Because, I mean, we already know that like nicotine is bad for you but who knows what else is in there. All right, and, and especially as we keep learning more and more about the harmful impact of vaping. And when we think about, cause you know, in schools, like for our families, like the jewel pods look like um, USB drives. And then for some, they can plug it into their computer to charge it up while they're working and they go vape while they're in the bathroom or other places um, as they're going on to their next class in school. And cause they're also doing it now in the pandemic, even when they're home, because you can buy them online and have it shipped to your house. So, and you don't even realize, it. you think that your child has bought some USB drives for their computer and in fact, they bought vaping devices. So when we think about the accessibility of these things and the impact um, that it has on our students and our families, and then it has this nice smell. So families really don't understand what it is because they smell like cotton candy. And so, because it doesn't smell like cigarette smoke. So they don't even know what it is. Um, and so we, as, you know, as a, as a parent myself, I'm a single parent, um, you know, my, my 11 year old is watching this. Um, and so as we're going through this and thinking about the impact that this has um, on, cause you're right, this was the generation that was supposed to like end smoking. And now look at it. I mean, you saw that graph from Dr. Baylor and like the, the rates of vaping is higher than what it was for cigarette smoke. So uh, it, it's just uh, like, I don't know, as a parent, it bothers me um, to see that there's a whole new generation becoming addicted to nicotine and the impact that it's gonna have in the future. Um, so as we're getting going, you know, and again, I want to thank our student panel um, for this important discussion. Um, so we are going to hear from our first place PSA winners video. So while we're listening, we want to ask that um, those of you who are watching to continue writing your questions and reflections into the chat box. And next, two of our partners, um, Dr. Karen Cruz and Ms. Laura Mitchell, um, they are reading through all your questions. And after this next set of videos, Karen and Laura will use some of the questions questions to get responses from all of our panelists. I just wanted to fit in. I thought that vaping would make me seem cool. I thought that it would give me more friends. So I tried it. And I thought it was safe, but it wasn't. Vaping tore my life apart and it changed me forever. At first it took the edge away, but then it took everything away. I couldn't concentrate in class and all I could think about was when I would be able to sneak a hit. At home, my vape never left my sight. I needed it. I my homework and before I knew it, I stopped doing my homework altogether. I stopped putting effort into my extracurriculars. My coach found out I was vaping and I lost my spot on the basketball team. Every last penny I had was spent fueling my addiction. I started having trouble falling asleep. I lost myself because of vaping, but my story is not over and neither is yours.
And next we're gonna have um, Dr. Karen Cruz and Ms. Lauren Mitchell who will be facilitating our panel. We'll have all of our panelists come and turn on their cameras. Hi, I'm Laura Mitchell. I chair the MCCPTA, the Countywide PTA uh, Substance Use Prevention Committee. And I'm a longtime advocate for substance use prevention and treatment. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen Cruz. I am the Director of Student Wellbeing and Achievement in Montgomery County Public Schools. And I also oversee uh, Ms. Stephanie Izzard's work and Mr. Sean Kelly on SUPRI. And I'm also an advocate for anti-vaping. Thank you. So we've been putting together all the questions and kind of grouping them into categories, and we do have quite a few. So we may not get to all of them, but I will ask for all of our panelists to turn on their cameras now so we can ask a couple of those questions. Um, let's start off with um, how has vaping become so widespread? And what are the long-term repercussions? We've heard a little bit, but I want to hear kind of what anybody has to say about, um, you know, looking down the road five, 10 years. What does that look like? So this is uh, Lieutenant Commander Chambers. I'll just start off. Um, so as we stated um, on both panels earlier, vaping has become so popular due to the extreme marketing that has happened and the specific targeting to the, to the younger generation. Um, as stated also before, it's most eight out of 10 kids who currently smoke a type of tobacco product use some type of flavored product with one of the most common flavors among teens being mango. So again, the, the tobacco companies are very intentional in how they are marketing uh, these products and making it come, become so mainstream. Now regarding long-term long effects, so now we have decades worth of data on smoking data, but not decades worth of vaping data. However, what we do know so far that there are long-term effects on, um, on the youth and, and the people in general when they do vape. Uh, one thing I can state here is that some vaping has been reported to cause seizures among youth. Uh, and as stated before in the keynote speaker, the brain is developing all the way through the mid-20s. So any type of nicotine that is entering into the body during this time, um, you know, it can make the body's uh, levels, chemical levels that are within the brain, such as like dopamine, which is your reward neurotransmitter, and it can lead to teens engaging in more risk-taking behavior, um, lack of impulse control, um, and as stated before, it can lead to doing more things such as taking other drugs, trying new things, driving dangerously, trying more illicit drugs. Uh, so, um, and then one last portion that a lot of people forget to talk about is the actual devices themselves. Um, sometimes they can become a little faulty and they've actually had physical, um, like, you know, on your face where like batteries have caught fire, explosions in your mouth. Um, you know, sometimes the the e-juice e gets into the hands of children and they ingest it. So there's just a lot of different things that can happen. And with COVID right now, the biggest thing that we're seeing is the lung damage. Uh, you know, they have something that's called Evali, which is the e-cigarette or vaping product use associated with lung injury. And it can happen with pretty much any type of um, vaping product, but it causes um, sometimes permanent damage and even death for um, when, when, when people use it. I would also add to, you know, when smoking was kind of in its heyday, doctors used to smoke cigarettes in hospitals. You know, I mean, that was the norm, that was common. And um, it, it wasn't until years and years and years and decades of research before people really understood the, the extent of um, the health problems that, that cigarettes cause. So we're kind of at the beginning with vaping because it's relatively a uh, new uh, product. And so, you know, it, it's a matter of time before you really fully understand the long-term uh, problems that, that vaping causes. Another question that we noticed in the chat is about um, vaping being a gateway substance. So is vaping considered a gateway substance to using other types of substances? I just want to reiterate um, what the Lieutenant said is in the brain research, um, youth 
brains are developing over time. So if you remember that graphic where the, the brain was getting bluer, and so those neur neural connections are forming. So we talk about growth mindset and how kids learn because effective effort, you know, learning from our mistakes, right? Well, the same thing about how we work for students to have the growth mindset, to keep trying and work through their mistakes in education with has adverse effects when you're talking about high risk behaviors like alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. If a student um, engages in those, then those neural connections say, I want more of that, make my neural connection stronger. And so then it causes the desire in the body to say, I need more, I need more, I need more. Um, so that's, that, um, that's how I would correlate it between use and, and risk behavior for young people with brain development. Tag on that to that, would you say that uh, it is kind of a permissions thing once they take that step to try the first taboo thing that, that might lead to a next step of trying a different taboo substance? I would say that um, it, it goes back to the multifaceted nature of our lives. Uh, we have, you know, where, where are the exposures coming from? Are the exposures coming from social media? Are they coming from in the home? Um, are they coming from peers? Um, what, what's the accessibility factor of those things? And then based on those, I would say it's, it could have a correlation for increased use. But I'd even like to hear from the students and what they think about um, what they've observed or seen their peers do with, with that question that was just posed. I do think that like, people will try vaping once or twice and maybe they don't see like the addiction effects then. And so they're like, oh, well, if I'm not addicted to this, then maybe I won't get addicted to weed or, or LSD. And then they'll go ahead and like try other stuff. And then they get to a point where all they're doing is drugs. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Um, I have countless friends who have told me that they like their vaping experience wasn't that bad. And, you know, it's not as bad as smoking which is of course not the truth. Um, and then I've sadly lost some of those friends because they've progressed into drinking alcohol and to taking other forms of far more severe and destructive drugs. And the thing is that throughout it all, they just keep thinking that, oh, if I just reach that next level, it's gonna be all right. And since I wasn't you know, completely ruined by drooling or vaping or alcohol, I can keep going. Like there's nothing that can stop me. It, it kind of becomes this like, destructive mindset of, oh, there's nothing wrong, like I'm invincible. And it, it's like a bit tied with ego, a bit tied with self-harm, because if you really think about this, the usage of any of these drugs and substances after so many years of like health class lessons nailing into you that you shouldn't be using them, it really is self-harm. And that comes back to the question of like, where are they mentally and what is causing them to use these drugs and to continue using it and start using worse substances as well. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's one thing that we haven't talked about. And that's like, how does use of drugs and alcohol link to, you know, someone trying to self-medicate, right? And the accessibility. And um, I think it always comes back to the mental and emotional health. Um, and even more prevalent now, we know that everybody's going through trauma. Um, and how are people trying to use vaping or other drugs to cope? And how can we redirect them and help them? to like have healthy coping mechanisms like exercise or hanging out with friends virtually or in a safe socially distanced way. Um, so thanks for elevating the, the greater why is not just accessibility and marketing, but like self-medication and coping mechanisms that we, we have to address the underlying issue for you sometimes. It's not just because it's an age demographic, oh, young people, they're at risk, but it could be other things that they're struggling through mentally, physically, and emotionally. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to add just one thing to that is I also want, you know, we have to do, we have to continue to do the job of letting people know that it's okay to not be okay. Um, we live in this world where everything is kind of instantaneous or everything is supposed to be perfect. So when things are not okay, students or and adults actually and anyone will go to find something to get the type of a, an escape in a sense to where they don't have to feel like they're in their current reality. But uh, just uh, emphasize, and I think Montgomery County does a really good job of, you know, uh, highlighting any type of mental health services, 
But just if we just continue to do that, continue to push it where it's more the norm than not the norm to say, I'm not okay. And reaching out for help is, is, is a, is a good thing. In the, in the mental health field, you know, we find that a lot of times when people have a history of trauma or, um, you know, experiencing some, some negative mental health concerns, um, that they are more vulnerable to using substances, including vaping. And it really is, you know, they go hand in hand. And so uh, I think that is really the, the foundation and the basis is just making sure that people are getting connected to resources early, you know, that if there are any mental health concerns that they're getting connected to, to helps and supports early on. Thank you for that. So another question that came up in the chat is about secondhand exposure. So if a person is exposed to the smoke of cigarettes or vaping, is that harmful for the person being affected? I mean, I think we could see that with just the laws and changes and regulations. I remember years ago, every time it was the holidays in the mall, there would be a little kiosk selling these vape things and they were doing it inside the mall. And now there are upgrades with signs that, you know, no vaping or smoking. Right. So we know that those particles that are emitted in vapors aren't water, they're chemicals. So we can infer, although we don't have data, longitudinal data about secondhand vapor, that there is chemicals being emitted and we're digesting those if you are around the secondhand vaping. Um, so I would definitely like to add on to that in terms of the secondhand smoke exposure. So there definitely is a severe impact when it comes to the secondhand um, perspective. So when, for example, let's just say you're a teenager and you're at a high school party, um, and then you just, like one of your friends starts to vape and you kind of smell this, the vape, um, the vape blows that came out of the vape pen. And because of that, I guess some people will think that, oh, it smells so nice. It smells amazing. It smells, like, wow, it's so cool. And because of that, it will affect the person that's affected because then they go home realizing that that is a really cool device and that they would like to try that out sometime. So it definitely does have an effect when it comes to um, the, secondhand, the secondhand smoking. So for example, um, in, in addition to that, um, a person might feel like the urge to just take the vape pen and just, and just like, you know, like hit the vape pen as well. So that's definitely also a, a very great impact. Yeah. And in health class, we talk about analyzing the influences around us from community media and the like. And that's exactly what we're talking about. That peer influence, the environmental influence, um, looking at valid and reliable resources. So thanks for elevating that. Yeah, I've heard some stories of a triggering asthma attacks for students in classrooms and bathrooms and things like that as well. So if you have an underlying condition, health condition yourself. So for the parents on the call and, and loved ones on the call, what are some of the signs that families um, need to be aware of that your child is vaping and where can you get uh, help and what are the strategies for helping them quit? Kind of combining two questions there. I, mean, I can go back to my, my sharing, and I just want to say um, that there is no real signs. Um, sometimes the, if you have um, young people, like the over-the-top smells of fruitiness and bubble gum and all that is irregular, so that would be a sign. But um, when I was younger, my, my room was a wreck, so I don't know that having a messy room is a sign, but it is a great hiding place for things. So um, just being aware of uh, messy rooms and um, possible hiding places for things is what I would say are, are some things to think about. I guess from like the student perspective, I think that like parents, what you all should do is don't, I think we should definitely be having conversations about this stuff in the house, especially just because there's just so much misinformation within student communities and the media. But talk with us, don't talk at us, because 
I think a lot of people might not want to tell their parent that they're involved in this kind of stuff or report it to the school or go ask for help because they're worried that they're going to be facing disciplinary action or, you know, get in trouble with their parents, which, you know, no, no one wants to be in that situation if um, they can avoid it. So just, just talk to us about it and, you know, understand that, I mean, obviously a lot of students don't know the effects. They don't know um, what the damage of this is. So, but also just, you know, saying like, hey, like when you're young, it's natural to want to try and experiment with things, but make sure that, you know, if you're not feeling well, or if you're, um, I guess, not in the best state that you should be, you know, trying to, you know, experience adult things, safe adult things in a safe way as you navigate through this changing world. I also feel like it's not what you say, but how you say it, you know, like asking like, what can I do to help you? What can I do to support, you know, you to stop doing these things instead of just accusing the student of doing something wrong? I mean, it is wrong, but the more guilty you make a person feel, the less they're going to want to talk to you. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, if we're going to look at this, like from like my perspective as a teenager, um, we just want someone who will, who's willing to listen to us. We have already got so much going on. And I feel like the reason why we're vaping is because we have this outlet that like, you know, that, that like, you know, some teenagers can escape from, they can escape from reality itself. And when they have this outlet, they, they don't know what's right or wrong anymore. They just, they just focus on the fact that they found a way to escape the reality that they're going through. And par what parents should definitely do is just sit down and listen to your kid. Don't ask them why they're doing this. Ask them why, like, you know, they, um, like the, why they found the route to, to approach this or like, you know, how, how are they feeling? What are they going through? Just like, just ask them like, you know, just simple questions like that, because I can guarantee you if you just listen to your kid and you just, you just like, let them just like come to you. Um, it would definitely have a greater impact on how you can positively move forward with the, um, I guess the reconciliation process. Yes. Talk to your kids about mental health. And adding on about mental health also, instead of like, you know, enforcing disciplinary actions and like grounding them or taking away their phone, um, you need to reinvest in like mental health resources, not only about talking about their mental health, but also looking into potentially connecting them with a psychologist or a therapist. And also consider mental health days. I know that there's some controversy over that in our county, but specifically looking at days in which you and your child have established that you, they definitely need a break from school. And instead of forcing them to go to school and go through whatever is causing them so much pain, having them stay at home and having some bonding time between you two, getting them off to school and into the world where they'll basically feel so isolated and alone that they think vaping is their only way to cope. Yeah. Not, oh, go ahead, Phoebe. Thank you. The last thing I wanted to say on this topic is that I think people forget that addiction is a disease that once you get addicted, your body becomes like physically dependent on this stuff. So if you treat it as like a health issue versus a disciplinary issue, I think that that would um, lead to a more productive way of dealing with it. And so students would actually think about, talk about the health consequences and, you know, coping mechanisms and how to actually, you know, not be addicted anymore versus, oh, you're grounded because that doesn't actually teach anyone anything about the dangers. Of it. I also feel like if like not only parents, but like schools have like a no question policy, because sometimes you do realize that you're doing something wrong. And the worst part is the shame that comes with trying to fix it. So if you have like a way to just I guess, give up your devices and to be able to find change without being questions of like where you got it, like why you did it. I feel like that will also help a lot of students. No, and I think looking, listening to our students and all the insight that they are sharing, you know, especially around the support of getting, needing help. And so we just want our families to know and our students to know that you have your school psychologist, you have your school counselors, some of your schools even have social workers um, that are here to provide support because a lot of times their students are starting to use substances because they're using this as a way of coping. They're in a sense of like self-medication. And so what can we do, you know, as the adults in the building to provide support? There are also programs, new programs like Supri, which is an alternative to discipline. 
you know, which is a way of providing um, information and drug treatment and so forth to our students and their families, because their families have to participate as well, um, as part of, you know, trying to help them to get the help that they need instead of thinking about, like, you know, we, we, went, we in this country spent years talking about the war on drugs and the criminalization of drugs instead of looking at the need for treatment. How can we provide treatment and support to our students and their families? Because a lot of times there's other things going on over there too, um, so that um, they can get to a place where they don't feel like they need to use the substance anymore and get their bodies to the point where they are no longer dependent on the drug. And so we in the schools, we are here to provide that support um, and also to then refer you to programs like SUPRI, programs like FRAP, programs like SASCA um, as a way of getting you the treatment that you need um, in order, and that's for all of our families um, in Montgomery County. And so um, talk to us, even if you're concerned about funding, talk to us so that we can get you the support, um, the mental health support and men behavioral health support that is needed um, in order to, um, as you say, to help your child to stop using that particular substance. And I, this is Alice, I'll just piggyback that really quick. I just also want to add to the parents out there, um, do know, like, utilizing these resources, there should be no shame in it. I think some of the issue, too, is not just the shame of the student, but also the shame of the family. There's not necessarily, there's nothing to do with you being a bad parent or not having a bad family structure, nothing of that nature. It is just, you know, at times everyone needs a little bit of hope, and if it's there, especially if the funding is there as well, you know, take up those um, resources. And, and, and just don't have that shame of, of having to do that. And also even just culturally speaking, a lot of cultures um, in the BIPOC community don't feel comfortable trying to solve problems in the home, outside of the home, but just know it's okay. Um, and I think we've come far with mental health supports as well as alcohol, tobacco, and other uh, drug supports in the BIPOC community. Um, and I was just, I would just summarize, like what I hear the students saying, almost screaming out loudly is, please don't yell at me for something I'm doing I'm to find out, you know, what's the reason why, like, talk to me, uh, communicate with me. And I know parents, we're not our kids' friends. You know, if anything, we're trying to help them be young, thriving adults so that they're independent and doing the things they need to do. But also acknowledge, like, when we're in the thick of things, like, we're, when we're stressed out, when we're in trauma, when it's midterms, like, I'm talking from the perspective of youth or even adults, Having a rough day at work, we don't always know we're in the trauma, right? We don't know we're in the thick of the storm because we're in it. And so somebody's like, well, well what's wrong? What's going on? They're like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I just like, I'm this, I'm done, you know? So it's okay if you don't have the answer of why you have the emotions you're feeling. You could just, you know, also as students, you can communicate up to your parents and say, I'm having a hard time. Uh, I don't really know what or why it's coming from right now, but I'm having a hard time. I need space or I need, I need an outlet. I need to do something. Um, and so students can communicate up and parents can communicate down um, to their, their children to say, hey, you know, like what's going on? Everything okay? And having those regular communication check-ins um, about life and just being open to listen without feeling that we have to uh, reprimand and accuse and punish and take devices away and cut off the social network um, and do all that. So that's the summary of what I heard that I think is a huge takeaway as a parent is don't start with the yelling or the the angry angry mom or dad or parent guardian, but start with the what's going on, everything okay? Like tell me more about what's happening here. Um, so thanks for elevating that. I think I learned to make sure when I'm in the heat of the moment and I find that and I'm frustrated and I'm upset. What? My kid doing this? What do I do? What do I do? Like, just yeah. take that back. Nice, calming yeah. breath and then just keep it moving. Keep it moving. I think that's a great point. And one of the big question that's in the chat um, is a side to side. If we have time for one more, it's about should you tell your friend to stop vaping and get them help, even if it ends your friendship? I mean, this will be our last comment. Yes, quickly. Yeah. 
Um, as someone who has done exactly that and lost friendships because I've told my friends not only the statistics, but also the fact that they can't cope by doing something like that and by continuing to vape, I will say it is worth it um, in the sense that, yes, you may lose that friendship, but if you were able to in any way help them stop, you know, falling down that course and like eventually entering a whole lifelong um, path of addiction, I would say that it is worth it because sure, you may lose them as a friend, but at least you won't be losing, you know, them completely and they won't like die later on from whatever diseases or whatever accident that they enter because of their vaping addiction. Thank you. Yeah, and I will also say for the students, you know, when you have like run into this type of situation, you know, try to be as empathetic as you possibly can in the beginning, you know, no vaping pledges. I know a lot of schools are doing that. Uh, just, you know, just work towards trying to, you know, help them and, you know, be a friend during that time. But I do understand there's sometimes that, you know, there, there will be friction and they won't listen. So, you know, you do what you think is best. Right. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Connolly. All thank right. You. So, oh, no. no, thank you. And so, um, we want to make sure to thank it. Um, e thank again each and every person um, for attending um, today's event. And I truly do hope that you've learned a lot around um, the impact of vaping, um, the impact it has on the body, um, the impact it has on mental health, um, the impact it has on relationships, and also some resources that are available um, for going forth and getting help um, during this time. And so, you know, so next, you know, I want to make sure we want to showcase, you know, additional resources um, that are available for our families um, on these topics and additional way making videos to watch. And then lastly, because I know some of our students have been waiting for this. So for our students that are watching this event, here is the SSL hours form um, that students need to complete to get credit for attending and receiving their SSL hours. Students must be logged into their MCPS student accounts to access this Google form. To be eligible for SSL hours, all responses must be submitted by 5 p.m. this evening, Saturday, February the 20th. Seventh, And again, all responses must be submitted by 5 p.m. this evening, Saturday, February 27th, in order for you to receive um, your SSL hours for this event. And so next, um, I also want to ask people if you can fill out our evaluation um, and survey um, for the event. You can hold your phone up to the screen and look at the QR code, or you can type in the form link um, into your browser. And so lastly, you know, I want to make sure to thank um, Karen, Laura, and our expert panelists for your time to be with us today. We truly do appreciate this conversation around vaping, and we hope that our students and our families have gained um, some good information um, about the impact that vaping has. Um, and so also, we want to thank our viewers for joining us for Waymaking. To send us additional questions and topics to discuss on our show, please visit the link on your screen. Also, please go to our YouTube playlist to find additional shows in our Waymaking series. This afternoon's program was live streamed on YouTube and will be available for playback. Don't forget to sub subscribe to our MCPS TV YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter for more programming and updates from MCPS. And please join us next time on MCPS Waymaking. <laughs>